And off we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, you are tuned into the Understanding Google Workspace for Education Plus webinar series. This is the fifth and final one for this series. Uh, no doubt we'll be doing a bit more of these next year. Um, uh, but today we're looking at one, I'm, I've just called it Work Smarter. Uh, if you recall back to previous sessions, actually before we do that, let's just um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet. I am back in Sydney today, back on Gadigal country of the Eora Nation. Um, recognise the traditional owners of that land whose customs have nurtured and continue to nurture the land and honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of the land. Um, there again is our mighty uh, Google for Education team across Australia and New Zealand. I can see I've just been joined by Jay Atwood. Hi, Jay. Um, good to have you here. Um, and as I said, this is uh, part of a five-part series we've been doing over the last few weeks. Uh, and uh, this is the last one here. In the first week, we talked a lot about Meet. There's a ton of plus features inside Meet. There's a ton inside Classroom. Uh, and of course, we heard from Rich about the security features and Joel last week about the uh, the data export features. So we've talked a fair bit about a whole bunch of things already. Today, I really want to, <coughs> pardon me, I want to go around and hoover up all the others. So there's little things sprinkled through the rest of the suite that are, uh, I think, relevant and important. So let's just take a look at those. Um, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat as we go. Um, I'm sure Jay will let me know if there's anything that comes up that I miss. Um, and of course, just to remind everyone that this series has been put together specifically for schools in the Catholic Education Network, CENET, and the Melbourne Archdiocese of Catholic Schools, um, many of whom dioceses have gone across to Workspace Plus um, and uh, are now running on that new um, system. All right, so uh, I'm going to. I'm just going to make a list today of some of the things that I want to show you. Um, and the ones in blue, I will actually try and go and do live demos of. It's always dangerous to do that, but we do like to live dangerously. So uh, just I'll run through them first, and then I'll try and pop out and do the live demo. So first of all, in Gmail, um, these are plus features. So if you're using the fundamental version of Workspace, you will not see these features. So plus users only get these. Um, the blue ones I'll try and demo. So first of all, in Gmail, we have a thing called Mail Layouts, uh, and that lets you do fancy emails, basically, uh, that, that uh, are templated. If you've used something like SurveyMonkey, if you've not sur is it SurveyMonkey? Yeah, um, no, um, a, ma a MailChimp, sorry, Mail too many monkeys. Um, MailChimp, uh, it's a similar kind of thing to MailChimp, where you have sort of the, the pretty email formats. Now, we couple that with another new feature for Plus called Multi-Send Mode. Uh, and multi-send mode lets you take uh, an email that's going to a bunch of different people. So you might have a whole bunch of people in the CC field or the BCC field or even the two field. Um, and what it will do is it will send each of those emails individually to people. So instead of sending one email to 50 people, it will send 50 emails to individual people. Now, along with multi-send mode, we just recently last week for Plus users announced uh, the ability to customize those emails by inserting uh, almost like a mail merge, their first name or their last name or their email address, uh, and that will expand further and get down the track. So that's some Gmail stuff. The calendar has a thing called Time Insights. Again, uh, it's a plus feature, and it tells you how you're spending your time. And one of the really neat things we've just added to that is color categorizations, where you can use um, uh, color coding to color code various types of meetings you have. So you might work on some projects and you can color code it and then it will tell you based on the color codings exactly how that time's being spent. Again, I'll demonstrate that for you in just a sec. <coughs> in Google Drive, a couple of interesting things in Drive. Uh, some of them are the geeky backend admin stuff, um, but trust rules for sharing is a really interesting one for schools that lets you isolate organizational units or groups from each other. So a classic example might be, let's say you don't want uh, the students in year six to be able to share documents with the students in year seven or, you know, or whatever group, pick, pick a group, whatever group you like. You can actually set up a boundary around certain groups that they can only share or be shared to from the groups that you allow. And I'll, I'll try and give you a live demo of that. We've also got a feature called Drive DLP. DLP stands for uh, Data Loss Prevention. Um, so here's an example for you. Let's say uh, someone is creating a Google Doc, and inside that Google Doc, they've put some information which is sensitive and shouldn't be shared outside the domain. Maybe it's a credit card number. Maybe it's a uh, student ID number. 
and it's going into a Google Doc that's getting shared outside the domain. DLP can flag that and alert people or even prevent that from happening so that the uh, the user is unable to share documents that have um, sensitive information. Um, target audience groups is a similar kind of thing to, uh, you, you know, in when you go to share a document, you can usually share it to the people you mention or anyone in your domain or anyone in the world. That's typically how it works. With target audience groups, you can actually specify specific groups. So you might create a target audience group called, say, teachers, and you put the teachers in your school into that group, uh, and then you can actually use that as a target group to send to. Um, I uh, worked in a school where we had a student and a teacher who happened to have the same name, and the student was forever getting emails that were meant for the teacher. Um, target audience groups would fix that problem because it would very clearly indicate who was in what groups. And finally, custom labels. Uh, in Google Drive, you can label documents now um, with things like uh, top secret or sensitive or uh, confidential, uh, and then you can do filters based on those labels. Um, in the fundamentals edition, those labels are fixed because there's a certain uh, uh, range to pick from. Uh, in the plus edition, you'll be able to customize those labels to what. All right, so that's that. Uh, in chat, uh, some really cool stuff in chat, mainly around um, making chat safer for students to use, um, and particular around moderation. Uh, we're introducing, uh, or the, there is right now, um, a whole bunch of moderation uh, options for chat and the ability to control file sharing. I should point out too, I, I, I said there, Dan, this is coming. It's a lot, all the stuff I'm talking about today is currently available, as far as I'm aware, to everybody on the Plus Edition. As I was putting this slide deck together, I was um, tempted to put a whole bunch of other stuff in here that I know is coming, but it hasn't been publicly announced yet, so I couldn't include it. But let me tell you, there is a whole bunch of stuff coming to PLUS for 2023, and we'll tell you about that as soon as we are able to. Um, in groups, there's some smart backend stuff coming to groups as well, or available in groups. Uh, dynamic groups, where groups can be created based on certain characteristics, whether they belong to certain OUs or um, you know, just just uh, creating groups based on who people are, and those groups change uh, depending on as people come in, in and out of those criteria. Uh, you'll be able to inspect the group membership, restrict the group membership, and uh, something that a lot of people have asked for for a long time is to be able to view members of a nested group. So right now, if you have a group that might be called something like you know Year Nine Teachers, uh, and you can send to Year Nine Teachers, but sometimes you can't actually see who's in that group. Uh, you'll be able to do that, you'll be able to view the members of those nested groups. Um, Google Docs has a really interesting thing called document approvals. So sometimes when you uh, have a document that needs to go to, say, leadership to be approved, might be a policy change or uh, the wording of a letter that's going to parents, um, you'll be able to flag that into a document approvals process where it has to be approved by somebody and then locked for editing so it doesn't get changed after it's approved. I'll try and show you that one as well today. There's a nice little feature in Docs called Show Editors that works based on the um, version history. Uh, and right now, if you want to see who's edited a document, you can do that by going into the version history. But Show Editors is a really nice little simple feature that lets you specifically look at a document and pick out who edited what. And I'll show you that. And then, of course, there's the assistive writing features in Docs that um, have sort of uh, rolled out into Docs over the last six months or so. Uh, and so now docs will flag things like, um, uh, you know, overly gendered language, um, non-inclusive language. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things in there um, uh, when, you're, when you're writing and you're using passive voice instead of active voice. So it will actually give you a whole bunch of uh, active writing features. Similar, I guess, if you want to compare it to one of our competitors, I suppose, to Grammarly. So that kind of thing now built straight into docs on the Plus Editions. Uh, classroom, we talked about Classroom separately a couple of weeks ago where we looked at the um, originality reports. And I did mention at the time that we have a few other things coming. One is uh, Classroom add-ons and the other is practice sets. Uh, and we try and take, take a quick look at that today. Um, we also had a session with Joel last week about the analytics and being able to export the analytics out of Classroom into a service called BigQuery and then use another service called Data Studio, or it's, as it's now called, Looker Studio, uh, to visualize those results and, and visually see the analytics of what's going on in your classroom. 
The one at the top there technically is not publicly available yet, but it is in alpha testing. So I thought I'd mention it. Um, it's called Class Visits. Class Visits allows a school leadership person to drop into a class. One of the big problems of classroom right now is if a principal or someone in leadership wants to have visibility into every classroom, they need to be made co-teachers of every classroom. And that can be both um, annoying for the teachers, but also annoying for the leaders as well, because they, when they open up Google Classroom, they have dozens or even hundreds of classrooms in their list. Uh, and they probably don't need that. Class visits will allow school leaders to search for a student or a teacher and then drop into that student's class without anyone actually adding them to the class. I believe they have membership of the class for several hours before it then removes them again. Uh, so it is documented. The teachers are aware that someone's come into the class uh, and is, is, is present in there, uh, and then that they automatically get removed. I think that would be a really nice feature for um, lots of schools who uh, have been dealing with that problem. Um, uh, I seem to have doubled myself up there on Drive, so you can ignore that. We've already talked about that. Um, some of the other features in Plus that are definitely worth thinking about is uh, when you go to the Plus edition, you get more storage. So uh, as you probably know, we um, moved to a different storage model over the last couple of years where we have pooled storage. And there's a fairly generous allocation of storage per domain. But when you move to the Plus edition, we increased that amount of storage by 20 gigabytes per user. And so you know, the bigger the domain, the more people are in it, the, the larger it gets. Uh, and so, yeah, that's all part of the Plus Edition. Cloud Search is a search tool that works right across the entire workspace suite. Uh, so right now, if you were looking for a document, say, you might go to Google Drive and you can search for that document and you might find it. Or you might go to Gmail and search for the email you're looking for and you'd find it. But the problem is that a lot of stuff you might want to look for, there could be an email trail and a document trail and you know someone, a person involved and a group involved. So Cloud Search lets you search for something across the entire domain in all of the various services. So you find everything across the domain. And I'll try and give you a demo. Uh, Client-side encryption is one of these uh, sort of nerdy things. It doesn't sound like it should be important, but it is. Um, some of our customers, uh, for security reasons, <coughs> they like to hold the keys to the encryption. So right now, any Google product you use is fully encrypted at rest and in transit. And so, you know, if, if some data was intercepted, and as far as I know, I don't believe that's ever happened to us, but if that, some data was ever intercepted, it's fully encrypted. Um, but what we offer with client-side encryption is for the customer to actually hold the key to that encryption. So even if someone was to get a packet of data that was going through our systems without the customer's key, it would be 100% useless to them. So it's kind of an important deal uh, for, for many customers. Um, AppSheet is a product that we make, which is uh, sort of a service that sits on top of Google Sheets, sort of, um, and allows you to make apps for your phone um, using nothing more than a Google Sheet. Uh, and so, so long as you have your data structured in a sheet correctly, you can run this sheet through this AppSheet service and uh, turn it into an app. Now, AppSheet is usually a paid service. Um, there is a free version of it, but it's somewhat limited. But AppSheet Core, which is the sort of the more fully functional version, is included in Workspace Plus. So if you're a Plus user, you have app access to AppSheet Core as well. And one of the other features that we've just introduced uh, for Plus is a thing called Admin Managed Takeout. So one of the services that Google has offered for a very long time is called Takeout, and that's um, if someone leaves your domain, so say your year 12s graduate, and they want to take some of the things out, or say your teachers leave and go to another school, they can go and use the Takeout service to take stuff out of Workspace. Um, so that's something we've offered for uh, a long time. But the difference now is that, so I'll just click that, um, is that uh, the admins will be able to determine which specific things are allowed to be taken using takeout. So for example, you might want X students to be able to take, I don't know, any photos they've stored in, in their Google Photos service, uh, and perhaps their documents, but you don't want them to take the emails for whatever reason. Okay, you, you uh, however you want to structure that. But you'll be able to specify specifically what's allowed to be taken out and what's not. And that's, it'll be granular based on product. 
All right, and as I said, there's lots more coming in 2023. There's some really cool stuff coming to Classroom, uh, to forms, to slides, to sites, and, and more stuff as well. But some of that is under NDA, and because this is not an NDA group, I can't really go into that detail. But if you are one of our NDA customers, we would be more than happy to set up a time to go through that NDA stuff with you. All right, let's um, just jump back to this first page. Uh, and let's jump into some of these things. So let's look at the Gmail stuff first. Let me come out of there and go to Gmail. So I, we, I talked about mail layouts. So um, this is uh, my, my Gmail service. This is not the account I normally use, so it's a bit of a mess in here. Uh, but if I go to the Compose button up here, you'll see with the Plus Edition, I get these two extra buttons here that you don't normally have. This one down the bottom says Choose Layout. So I can take this from being just a plain old boring white uh, email to uh, having a whole bunch of templates in here. Now, what I've done when I set this up the first time is you go down to where it says default styling and you can choose things like put in your logo, put in your color scheme, you can choose the footer details that you'd like to have on your emails. Uh, if there's any links to things like email or Twitter or you can put things like um, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and so on. So you can put all of those in there and, and that will include the links at the bottom of the email. Um, and once you set that up, you, then you can pick a template. So let's say I pick, uh, say, this one here, right? And I say insert. What it does is it generates an email for me. And I might just pop this out so it stands a little bigger. There you go, so you can see that better. Oops, sorry, you would if I didn't click that button. Um, oh, I'm silly, sorry. I don't know what I did there. Uh, let me do that again. Okay, try that again. This time be careful with the mouse. Right, so here you go. So this is what it would look like, and you can see I can come in here and say, you know, uh, my newsletter. Right, and you can um, get the idea. Uh, and you can change all the text and do all that sort of stuff. And it, as you can see, it's put in all the um, bits and pieces that I've put in from the settings. If you don't want something in here, you can click on it and say just remove. If you don't want that button there, you can remove it. You can change where it links to. So if you wanted to point that button to a Google form or to another web link or something, you can do that just by changing that link there. So that is the uh, templates. Now, the other thing that I mentioned was we now have um, the customized emails. So let me just show you how that works. I'll get rid of this dummy text here. And let's say I say, dear, and I want to now put someone's name in here. I can type an at symbol. I thought I keep going on. Um, oh, little demos don't work. Dear at. Oh, that's interesting. Why is it doing that? Mm -hmm. I tested this earlier, I promise. Uh, I don't know why it's not doing it for me now. Let me just close this up. I'm still in a regular email just to show you how it works. If I go, uh, oh, I know why it didn't work. Because there's a button down the bottom here, this one that says toggle multi-send mode. Okay, so this is this multi-send mode I was talking about where you send an email to many people uh, so if I go in here and put a recipient list in here, and uh, so I'll, I'll choose this group, for example. There's about 300 people in this group, right? And if I was to send to that group, I would they would go to everybody. What I can do in uh, multi-send mode is it will send an individual email to everybody instead of going... Oh, I see that's a terrible example because that is already a group. Um, this way. I'll do J and I'll do Kipoli. Okay. We'll do it that way. Okay, <laughs> I'm sending one email to two people. If I go into this multi-send mode, I'll send two emails to each person individually. Okay, so that's what that will do. Now, once I've once I've turned that send mode on, I can go in here now, and now I type the at symbol, and as you can see, it offers me a first name, surname, full name, or email. So I can say, dear, at, and insert the first name, comma, and then go on and type my letter. So, sorry, I forgot to turn that multi-send mode on when I was trying to show you that before. But you can combine the, the template and the multi-send mode together. So you can do templated, personalized, pretty emails using those two features together. So I hope that makes sense. By the way, uh, you'll notice if you do send multi-send mode, you get an unsubscribe link at the bottom so people can unsubscribe from this. It does treat it like a mailing list per se. Uh, and they can unsubscribe. And the other thing to know about it too is if you send, say, send an email to 100 people, you won't get 100 emails sitting in your outbox or your sent mailbox. It will actually just get one. It moves all the rest to the um, to the to the bin basically and keeps a copy of the master email that went out. 
So it doesn't actually fill up your sent mail with all the emails you've sent. It just gives you the master copy that you can go back and revisit them later if you need to. All right, hope that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so there you go. So that that's the first couple of features there, mail layouts and multi-send mode. Um, uh, let's look about calendar. So in calendar, there's time insights and color uh, categorizations. Let me find my calendar, here it is here. Now, this is a dummy calendar. This is not my real calendar. It does, it does bring in all these busy things. That's from my actual calendar, but the rest of the stuff is just made up stuff. Now, what I've done in here is I've color coded some things. So if I create an appointment in this calendar, so my calendar on this particular calendar is purple. That's the default color. So I can say, um, meet with Jay, right? right? And I might want to say that Jay and I are working on the yearbook together. So I can come in here and choose from this list here a color, and then I can assign a color a name. So you can see I've already assigned this orangey red color to the yearbook committee. So I can assign that. So I'm now categorizing my calendar in, uh, calendar appointments based on color. So when I save that, it will actually come in here and it'll show me how I'm spending my time. I'm just going to turn this time insights thing off for a second because I'll just go over to this side and show you. This is what you get by default. This little panel on the left-hand side that shows you a kind of a, a, a really basic snapshot of how you're spending your time based on how you're categorizing things. But if I go in here and say more insights, that's when it opens this panel on the right-hand side and it lets me dig in a little bit deeper. So if I do it by type, the type of meetings I'm having, I have uh, a one-on-one -on -one meeting there. I have a meeting here with more than three guests. That's you guys right now. And you can see as I'm mousing over those, they're lighting up for me to show me whereabouts on my calendar that's showing. It's also going down here and telling me how I'm spending my time, which weeks are the busiest, how many hours I'm spending in meetings and so on. Um, and again, this is a dummy calendar. This is a lot more interesting if it's a real calendar with lots of real meetings. But I think you get the idea. It'll tell you how you're spending your time. So that's the by type. And if I switch to the by color, it'll actually use that color coding that I've put in. So there are the yellow things. That's focus time. There are the orange things. That's the yearbook committee. The green things are you know, before and after school duty. And I can actually see how much of my time I'm spending on various things. So that's Time Insights. I think it's a really interesting thing for people to be able to see exactly where their time is going um, based on the work they're putting in their calendar. And that is built right into Workspace Plus. That's the Time Insights and Color Categorizations. Now, the trust rules for sharing is an interesting one. Let me try and show you this. It's always interesting to try and demo stuff. This is the admin console. If you're a regular classroom teacher, you probably will not ever see this. Uh, but I see a couple of you in the group here today are uh, probably administrators and have access to this. So you come into the rules section here and there's a new rule type you can create now called a trust rule. When you create a trust rule, it will ask me to log in. That's what it'll do. So I set it up earlier and then left it too long. Okay, so I'm just logging back in. Okay, so here's when you're creating a trust rule, what you do is you give the rule a name. So I'll call it uh, Safe Year 7, right? And then you describe your rule. You can give it a description. And then you can come down here and say, okay, I want to include either a specific organizational unit or I want to exclude a specific organizational unit or include or exclude a group. So you can define the group of people you're talking about. Let's just use an organizational unit. So right here in my demo class, I have a bunch of students called Chris's kids, right? So I'm going to apply this rule to Chris's kids. And I'm going to go in here and then go to the next step here, right? Continue. What do I want to allow or disallow Chris's kids to do? Well, I want to affect the way they share things and the way they receive things. So let's say my kids are a year six group. I don't want them interacting with the year seven group. So that's what I want to do there. And the conditions, uh, I want to say is an organizational unit is, um, so I don't want them to share with uh, Steve's kids. Okay, so I can set all that up. Now I've actually, I won't continue on that because I've actually made one earlier that I just want to show you. I've already set it up and it's this one here called uh, Chris's kids, keeping Chris's kids safe. So this is the trust rule as it's set up. So it applies to this particular OU it applies to Google Drive sharing and receiving. It applies to Steve's kids 
and I'm blocking Google Drive Actions from happening. Now, hopefully, if I switch users over here, this is one of the students in my class. Um, I can't think of the name of, oh, I can't think of the name of Steve's kids. Uh, give me one sec, guys. I go to the directory to the users, and I will find from here students, Steve's kids, uh, Dave. That, let's pick Dave. Okay. So let's say I'm this student here in my class, and I've created a Google Doc, and I want to share it now with Dave. So I click on the share button. I start typing in Dave. There he is, Dave Hoff. And I try and share this with this student, and I click send. And now I get a message that says you can't share this because of a policy that's been set up by the administrator. So what this trust rule thing lets you do is to put up these sort of fences around certain groups if you need to do that. And it can be very granular. Uh, and in terms of keeping kids safe and making sure that you know the wrong kids are not talking to the wrong other kids, uh, you've got a lot of control over setting that up. Again, when I say you, maybe not you, because you might not be the administrator, but administrators have a lot of control over now um, what kids are allowed to share and where they're allowed to share. It's more granularly. You've always been able to do it like can't share outside the domain or can't share in like big ways, but this is bringing it down to really sort of granular specific ways. Hope that makes sense. That is called trust rules. Um, let's have a look at documents, docs, Google Docs. So I have got a document here. And this might be a document that I've been working on and I need to get someone to approve this document because uh, it just needs to go through another set of eyes. So uh, Jay, maybe you can help me out with this if you don't mind. Um, are you, Jay, are you on your Google account or your uh, Chrome Fruity account? Uh, Google. Okay, I'll use that one. Thank you. So I, want, I need to get this approved by Jay. So I need to go to the file menu up here, and you'll see I've got an option here that says approvals. Again, plus addition thing. If you're on fundamentals, you don't see this. I go to approvals. It opens a panel on the side here, and I can now make a request for this document to be approved as part of an approval workflow. So I'm going to add jayatwood at google.com. There you go. And I'll say, please review. And uh, I can add a due date if I like. So if it needs to be done by a certain date, I won't put that in there, but you can do that. Um, you can also choose whether you want to allow the approver to edit the file. So maybe uh, they have a small change they want to make. Do you want to let them do it or do you want to, do you want to come back to you for you to do? So you can, you can do that. So either there. Um, and I'm just going to send that request. So that has now gone off. And you'll see in the panel on the side here, well, first of all, this wasn't shared with Jay. So it's just reminding me that if this is going to work, I need to give Jay access. So yes, I'll give him access there. I will share that. And over on the side panel now, you should see it now says, here's the status. This document from me has gone to Jay to get approved, and the approval is pending. And maybe, Jay, if you could just see if that arrives for you, and if you are happy with it, if you could approve it, that'd be lovely. So I can see that Jay's just dropped into the document here. You can see he's just appeared at the top of the page. And checking out the approval details and what was that? Yeah, we're just checking out the approval details tab. Uh -huh. You want to tell us what you're saying? Uh, it says I see a message that says please review <laughs> and a panel on the right hand side. Okay. It says approval pending. Now from my perspective, you guys can see mine says pending approval. Okay, and I can I can view the details and that really it's just it's just this panel on the side. Okay. And, I'm still and waiting for Jay to approve that. And he could leave a comment for me if you like. He could ask me for more details and we could have a conversation about it. I could add more users and so on. Now one of the things to think about this is um, if a document goes for approval, when it's approved, you obviously don't want anyone changing it after it's been approved. And so what will happen is as soon as Jay approves this, it will be locked down. And none of us will be able to make any changes unless we explicitly unlock it again. Where, uh, where's my approval but button, though? Uh, that's, that's, that's a good question. question. I would have thought it would be right there. I thought it would be, too. So I was looking at it and trying to find it, but I don't see You're it. You're not saying that? No. I see the approvals, pending approval. It says open. Yeah. And there's no button click anywhere. That's very odd. Yeah. It says I have to request access to edit, but I don't need edit access to make the approvals, do I? Uh, I wouldn't have thought so, no. I'm okay. sure has opened a hand. Uh, yes, Cheryl. 
Just wondering if um, Jay makes changes in the approval process, uh -huh. will it show it in the side box on the right? I believe it does. It certainly shows it in the document because okay. he's been because he's been approved as a um, uh, a commenter. Oh, I see what happened. This came up in my come for edu. That's what, oh, okay. Uh, so you're yeah. on it now. I mean, come for edu. Can you resend it to that? Then I will see the button. That's why. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. No worries. Uh, so Jay's on a different account. So I'm just going to change the approver. You can see I can do that by clicking on change approver. The new approver will be Jay at Chrome for edu. Okay. It's funny because I was not logged into that, but it um, kicks me into it. And Okay. Yes, here at Google, sometimes we work across multiple domains, so things can sometimes get a little confusing. But um, for most of you guys, you'll just be in a single domain. You can see in the in the record here, it's actually showing that I've removed uh, that version of J and installed the other version of J. How's that looking now? Now it's looking good, and I see up at the top. There's in the blue bar at the top. It says approve, reject, or view, de view details. I will okay. approve you. Okay. And I'm assuming as soon as you've done that, uh, that little pending that's showing there. Okay, great. So you see what's happened here on my screen. It says the file is now locked. File is locked from editing. So I need to reload that. And what I will see over here um, is reloading. Okay. At the top here, it says it's an approved version. This is the last approved version. Now, because it's approved, it is locked. I can't make any more changes. If something, like if I really had to change something again, I could come in here and I could unlock the file. But of course, if I do that, then it's got to go back through the approval process again, because it's no longer the thing that was approved. I hope that makes sense. Um, so yeah, aside from that little snafu with using the, uh, the, um, the other email account, you can see that it's a pretty simple process. You literally just choose from the file menu, to send it off for approval. The other person gets it, hits the approve or reject button. And um, it's as simple as that. So that is that feature there called um, document approvals. Uh, I mentioned show editors before, and um, this is just a document that was edited by a couple of different people. If I look at, um, well, if I, if I go to the, the version history, You'll see in the version history that this document has been edited by mainly me, but if I go back in time, it's been edited by various people at different times. Um, but earlier today, I had uh, one of my dummy students, Helen Highwater, went in and made an edit, and you can see the thing she's changed here in blue. Now, you can see that here in the version history, but let's just come out of version history for a second. The way this works is if I want to know who wrote a specific word, who wrote the word totally, I can select that word, Right click it and say, show the editor of that word. And it's going to say, Helen was the person who wrote that word. If I go to the word next to it, which I wrote, and I do the same thing, show the editors, it says that Chris Petra wrote that word. And if I was to pick a piece of text that contained more than one editor, so say those, those few words in the beginning of that sentence, and say, show me the editors of those, it says Helen was one of the editors, but there's more. And now it shows me there were two editors that contributed to that sentence. So the show editors option, again, it's a plus feature. You won't find it in fundamentals. Um, but it's a really nice way of just being able to sort of see specifically who wrote what. Great for group work. If you get a bunch of kids working on something, you can specifically go in and see who did what. Uh, and so, yeah, combined with the version history, I think that's a nice way of being able to see what's going on. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'll try and be quick. The assistive writing features, um, uh, look, they're kind of hard to demonstrate, but basically they're, they're kind of like a Grammarly-esque kind of thing where it'll give you writing suggestions on your on your wording, your grammar inside your, your writing. Um, and you get a whole bunch of very powerful ones inside the Plus Edition that aren't in the, the regular edition. Uh, let's go over to this other page for a second. So Classroom add-ons. Let's just pop into Classroom. Pop the classroom open. I do not. Classroom.google.com. Uh, we did kind of touch on these a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at the originality reports. Um, but if I go into my demonstration class here, you'll see that on the classwork page, uh, we do have when you create a new assignment, you have now this thing called practice sets. 
I think we did kind of unpack this a couple of weeks ago, so I won't dwell on it, but practice sets is a is a plus feature that enables you to create, um, how would you describe it, really smart quizzes for students. So if you're trying to leave some revision work or some sort of homework things for students to just revise some sort of core concepts, um, it uses the power of artificial intelligence to act as a sort of a homework tutor, if you like, uh, to help students um, go through sort of quizzes and uh, exercises to practice their and solidify their knowledge. Um, to get to, pre oh, I'll just come back to that. And then on the other side here, you've got add-ons. And the add-ons, again, these have to be approved by an administrator. So you may see a limited range of these. You may see none at all, uh, depending on what's been approved. But you can use these to install, um, uh, if you want to use any of these services as work for your students. I used to be a media teacher, so I would use video production quite a bit. So if I wanted to set my students a video production task, I can actually click on that now and it will add a wee video video editing task. I need to sign into that, so I'm not going to do that right now. But you can add a, a, a video editing task to an assignment in the same way that you might add a Google Doc or a slides presentation uh, as work for students. And there's a whole bunch of them there as well. So that is the add-ons. Again, it's a plus thing. I'll real quickly just show you the practice sets. We kind of touched on it the other week, but Practice sets show up here in practice sets, and uh, they are the ability for teachers to create um, smart quizzes. It's the simplest way to describe it. Um, and in each of those smart quizzes, uh, you have the ability for students to use things like handwriting. They get a little scratch pad. If I, if I see what this looks like as a student, uh, it will load up, and it will show me things like, so yeah, how many sides does the trail have? Well, it's got three. I can actually type the number three in there and check it. And yes, of course, it's going to mark me as correct. Uh, but things like this, if you want to show your work, there's a scratch pad at the bottom there. I can actually use a, a scribble pad there. So I can go to x plus six equals ten. X equals two. X equals four. X equals two. So whatever. Sorry about my writing. Um, but there's a scratch pad there, and that then goes into uh, the, the class. Now, let me show you what it looks like as a finished product. Um, if I come out of practice sets and back into my demonstration class, you will see be able to see an example of that here under algebra practice. And if I go into the students that have handed this in, uh, what you'll see up the top here is I can see each of the students' individual results, but what I like is this class insights. Um, when I get the class insights from a practice set, it will do something rather clever. It'll tell me up the top here uh, a kind of an insightful summary of what's happened. So this one will tell me that uh, a couple of students haven't done too well. So five students got number seven incorrect, and Walter and Bart are struggling with some problems. And I can see all the results here. If I go into here and click on a problem, I can see all the different student answers to that problem. But this has all been marked and graded by AI. I haven't had to manually do this myself. So it's a good diagnostic tool for teachers. It'll flag problems, and then you can go in and dive into those problems rather than spend a lot of time marking and grading each individual one because the AI tutor has already done that for you. So I think it's going to be a great feature. Uh, and again, it's a plus thing, so you guys can make the most of it um, when it launches. It hasn't launched yet. It is in uh, hopefully final stages of beta, and you'll get it very soon, I hope. Uh, so that's add-ons and practice sets. Uh, we talked about the drive stuff. We doubled up on that. And the last thing I just want to demo for you is a thing called Cloud Search. Uh, so Cloud Search, you'll find if you open up a new tab and go to the – now, assuming this is turned on for you by the administrator, uh, as a plus school, you have access to it as long as it's turned on. Um, it's this service down here called Cloud Search. Okay, and when you load Cloud Search, I've already done it right here. So this is what Cloud Search looks like. It's basically a search engine for your domain. So right now, I know uh, we're running a thing called Learn with Google, and I've done a whole bunch of things for that. So if I type in Learn with Google, you'll see it pulls up all the different things from right across the domain. So I found here's a site, here's a spreadsheet, here's some slide decks. If I go down there, here's some images that I've created. So this is doing a lot of searching across Drive, but it's also found the Google Groups that's associated with this. Um, so if I click on the sites link at the top there, it's finding any sites that might be relevant to this search, any drive results that might be relevant to the search, any emails. I'm not sure if there are any emails for this one. Yes, I've turned off the emails there. But 
It's, it's finding all sorts of things that are relevant to that search right across the domain, uh, regardless of which service it's actually using. So that's cloud search, it's a very powerful thing. It's also available as an option in Google Sites as well. So if you're building a Google Site and it's turned on for you, uh, you'll have the option to use cloud search as a feature to plug right into your Google Site as well. Wow, okay, and we're just about on time. So uh, I think we're trying to finish by 4.30. So Richard says, is there any age restrictions on any of these new features? Uh, that is an outstanding question, Richard. I would have to check that for you. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, let me find an answer for you. Uh, I will drop my email address into the chat. And if you want to send me that directly so I don't forget, um, I will try and find you an answer. Uh, anyone else or anything at all? Any questions or anything you might have? Okay, everyone's very quiet today. All right, well, on that note, hope, hopefully uh, that rounds out our five part series of uh, some of the things that are available in Plus. So we've looked at over the last five weeks, we've looked at security, we've looked at data analytics, we've looked at the stuff in Meet. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of stuff in Meet. Um, uh, and I guess as we come out of remote learning, that might be less relevant than it once was, um, but there's a lot of great stuff inside Meet. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff inside Classroom and coming to Classroom as well. Uh, and hopefully you can see that there is all sorts of little goodies sprinkled throughout the suite, and we anticipate that that will continue as well. Um, we are still committed to providing schools with the fundamentals edition for those schools that want to keep using the free edition. Uh, we have no plans to take that away, but we do definitely understand that some schools want um, some of these more power user features. Uh, and unfortunately, like a lot of things in life, it costs money to provide these things. And so that's why we offer this as a paid option for schools that would like it. And for most of you, uh, your systems have taken up that offer and we hope you get great value from it. If there's anything we can do here at Google to help you get value out of these tools uh, over the coming uh, you know, years, um, please do reach out. We, we would love to help. Uh, and on that note, I think I'll wrap it up and say thank you very much. I will stop the recording.